You're listening to the Public Health Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Dr. Charlotte Huntley. Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Public Health Entrepreneurs. I'm excited to have a guest on this episode, which most of these episodes are just me coaching and sharing with you. But I promised I would be bringing some guests on for inspiration. And my guest today is a great example of that. So if you're new to this podcast, we cover topics of interest at this intersection of public health and entrepreneurship. And I'm your host, I'm Dr. Huntley. I am a public health entrepreneur with well over 20 years of experience. I really started counting that recently. It's more like over 25 years of experience, but I've helped and supported and coached a lot of entrepreneurs along the way. So on this episode, we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to my colleague and dear friend. I'm thinking at some point, we're going to realize that we're probably related (laughs) because we have family in the same region and I've known her for a very long time. So Dr. Joy Washington, welcome to the Public Health Entrepreneurs Podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on this podcast. Now, she's been a guest on my other podcast, Public Health Epidemiology Conversations, but she is an entrepreneur and an incredible public health professional. So we're going to dive into a little bit. Some of you may already know her, but if you don't know her, you're going to get to know her. So let's start with you just introducing yourself. You do such a great job. I love hearing you talk about your business. So introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business. Yes, absolutely. I am Dr. Joy Washington. I prefer to go by Dr. Joy. If you see me on LinkedIn or Instagram or anywhere on these internet streets, please call me Dr. Joy or even in person. Dr. Washington sounds super old. I don't like it. (laughs) (laughs) I tell people that all the time, but... I am a community engaged research consultant. I am a researcher at heart overall. I started out in the biomedical sciences. I get a lot of people who, and Dr. Henley, you and I have talked about this, how we come from the hard hard sciences and, and maneuver our way, fumble our way into public health. So I am a research across the sciences, uh, but my heart is in community engaged research. I'm the CEO of Joy Washington Consulting, LLC, where we help organizations to successfully implement their community-engaged research strategies. And so our mission is really to help revolutionize public health research by transforming public health research into life-changing public health solutions, because oftentimes that's where the disconnect happens. A lot of research happens, right? But for some reason, the solutions don't get to the community. So we really work with public health organizations, community-based organizations, nonprofits to help them build meaningful community partnerships, conduct impactful research, and that's positive, impactful research, and then create data-informed solutions that bring joy to our communities. I am also the host of the Public Health Joy podcast which is a safe space where we have real conversations about our creative and innovative approaches to public health research that is done with, for, and by our communities. I love hearing you say that. Your introduction never gets old for me. I think that it's wonderful. I do come from a different perspective only for a long time, and this, this clarity has really evolved, but you have always had such a passion for the community and you def- you define research and how it can look so many different ways in supporting and engaging the community and making sure that we are giving back. Like you said, we've got a long history of researchers coming into communities, conducting, building relationships, getting what they need and then leaving. Or the funding runs out on these programs and then the people go away and the community is left like, what's going on? You know, what was that? <laughs> And so I really appreciate your intentional build to focus on addressing that. That's extremely important because you're serving communities. You know, we have this Mississippi connection. You know, I have my mother's family in Mississippi. I still have siblings in Mississippi and a lot of family there. So you're serving a community that's very near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate, you know, the angle and approach. When did you first become interested in public health as a career? I will say for me, like I mentioned earlier, coming from the hard sciences, like probably 99.7% of the people I run into, I was going to be a medical doctor. Like that was my dream. That was my goal. I was going to go to medical school. I was going to be a trauma surgeon working in the ER, like whole nine yards. That did not work out for me (laughs) right? for a number of different reasons. But really what gave me the push that I needed was I was actually in a graduate program in physiology and biophysics. And 
I was working in the research lab. And so what I realized was, you know, as I was learning all this great information, I would go home or go to my family and friends and tell them about how the body works. You know, how does all this medication work or whatever I was learning in class? And they would look at me like, I have no clue what you're talking about. And I'm in my head, something clicked for me. I said, you know, okay, I'm learning all this great information and yet nobody knows it. Or at least the people that I'm close to, nobody knows it. And so how can I get this information out to my community? And what does that look like? Like what career is that? What field is that? And that's how I came across health education, particularly. And I've been I've been exposed to public health since I was in high school. There's a program called the Jackson Heart Study. It is the largest single site epidemiological study of African-Americans in cardiovascular health, I believe. I was part of their program in high school in the summer. And so I've been exposed to public health for a long time, but it never clicked to me that that would be a career path for me. And so once I kind of was able to kind of have that light bulb moment that, oh, there's a lot of research happening and a lot of information out there that's not getting to my community, how do I make that happen? That was the shift for me in in what drove me into my, my public health career. That's really good. Now, my next question is kind of twofold. I'm curious to know what made you decide to go the entrepreneurial route? As you know, you have so many options. You could have worked somewhere else and stayed there and built your career. So I'm curious about that. And then the other part of that is just kind of add in how some of those other experiences you've had help prepare you for entrepreneurship. Yeah, I would definitely say COVID, the pandemic was the push. I I had always kind of known that I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship on some level. I just had no idea what it would look like. And so when COVID hit, I actually had proposed for my dissertation the first week of March 2020 in a room with people, no mask, no before, before mm-hmm. all H double hockey sticks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, happy, you know, broke loose. And so as I was stalled on my dissertation, I started thinking, okay, what can I do during this time? And so I was like, okay, well, I might as well figure out what does it look like to start a business? Because as I started seeing what higher education and what academia was going through during the pandemic, I said, you know what? I don't know if I want this life. I mean, my original plan was to, you know, get my PhD, become a full-time faculty member, you know, do the normal thing. And after I saw how it kind of upended everything during the pandemic, I said, "Ah, I got to see what else is out there. Like before I make that decision, I need to see if I can, if there's a way for me to do this on my own, because I really don't want to live that life. So that was kind of the first thing that drove me into the entrepreneurship lane. And what I ended up realizing, this kind of goes into the second part of your question, is that I had no idea how to run a business. I'd never taken a business class. I don't know anything about economics and revenue and market and your audience and branding. And I had no clue. And so the things that I was able to bring with me in terms of knowledge in my entrepreneurship journey was, of course, the public health stuff, right? I could take what I had learned and my experiences and I could see, you know, when we're talking about business stuff where like, what problem do you solve? So I was able to identify, oh, there's a problem here. There is a disconnect here. I could see that. What I did not know was how do I build a business and make money around this problem? Like the problem is glaring. I can use my skills, my public health skills, my health education skills, my research skills to help people to fill in that gap. But it was the business side that I was missing. I remember that feeling. And I know that that's where a lot of people get stuck. You actually use air quotes because it's really just a feeling, you know. And then I'll see a lot of people pivot because, you know, we're, we know we built our academic backgrounds to get to where we are. So they go looking for the next degree. But I often find out that it's a different type of feel, F I L L, to, for what we're missing. Uh, we just need to have the structures and we can learn that and we can get coached on that. Or we can receive that without having to go look for a degree necessarily, because we already know what we do. We have expertise here, 
But I think there's sometimes people feel like they have to be the expert in absolutely everything in order for this to work. And then we just need to prepare or create something around what that allows us to be the expert in the thing that we're passionate about and driving forward. So you, I remember those days. I remember March 2020 very clearly. <laughs> March was a very big moment for me because that's when I left my my job full time. It was 100% in my business right before everything shut down. Like literally a week after I sent all my equipment back, everything shut down. So I definitely remember that feeling. But also we learn a lot because you jump in and you, you start swimming and you figure it out as you're going. And I remember watching you really start to kind of moving through that way because we were always in each other's networks and circles. So, you know, we could, we were following along and I just remember watching your growth during that time. So it seems like it was such a long time ago, but then again, it seemed like it was like, like it just happened kind of thing. It's a weird time warp, isn't it? It is. It is. And I will also say, you know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted my business to look like when I first started, when I first made the decision. And so I started with what I knew. And at the time, I was actually a graduate assistant. And so I was helping graduate students with their, we worked in what's called a research support center. And so they would bring in their research projects or coursework or things like that in, and we would help them with it. And I said, oh, well, I could just, could I just do this on my own? Instead of having to do it through the university, like could students just come to me and I help them with their research projects or with their coursework. So that's actually what I started doing through my business. Like I got I got legaled up. I got the LLC. I got the, you know, all the things. But what I'm doing now is not what I was doing then. I was literally reaching out to folks or folks would be reaching out to me to help them with their coursework, like their research coursework. I did a little bit of stats tutoring. And look, no, do not call me for stats tutoring now. Okay. Do not. That was a past life. I'm not doing that no more. Okay. But that's where I started. Like, and now I'm not doing that at all. So it's the it's the evolution of the business that I had to learn to lean into. You might have an idea or you might be looking at different things that have come in from your business and I'm a researcher, right? So the data will tell you if you need to shift, if you need to pivot, if you need, if you're not making enough money, you know, that's, that's data, right? You're looking at the numbers, you're looking at your finances. The first time I started working with an organization through my business, I was like, oh, I got students paying me $25, $50 over here, but I got a whole organization that's going to pay me a thousand, two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars over here. I love y'all, but <laughs> I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to figure out a different way to support you because I need the data is telling me my business model needs to shift because there's a there's a, a different kind of problem over here that's gonna pay me a different kind of amount of money. I love that you're sharing that, and that's a very important thing for a number of reasons. First, I love that you say you know start with what you know because a lot of people, and this is not picking on anyone. But fear shows up right at that point where you decide, I want to do something, but I'm not quite ready. And fear will have you chasing after the next degree or trying to make your website perfect or trying to overly obsess over these packages and offering. But if you just jump in, you figure things out in real time and you start to generate revenue. I mean, that's why we're in business. We can't be afraid to make money. And those first few projects, I mean, we all think about, I think about pricing and everything I did back in the early days and cringe. But if we had never jumped in, we would never would have discovered what we really are good at or what we really like or had the opportunities that came after getting started. So that's a very, very important mindset is to start, like start with where you are, start with something and and you learn in the process, you know, as you go. And, And it's nice to hear, we're talking about where we are in business and think about where we are now. Like we talked about where we, you know, a few years ago in the pandemic and think about, you know, when that happened, when everything shut down, I was being sought after like never before. Like I, when I left my full-time job and was all in the business, I had a new contract. I knew that was a lot of opportunity. So I had something to feed off of. But then everybody from everywhere was reaching out to me because I have a virology background. And so people are typing, what's this new virus thing they're talking about? So we're getting those questions. I'm an epidemiologist. So people are trying to figure that out. And then of course, the public health angle. So all sorts of opportunities were coming up and I was saying yes to everything, but out of a little bit of fear and panic. But, you know, 
But as much as that overwhelmed me, it taught me a lot about what, like you said, what I like doing and what I wanted to do more of and what I did not want to do. I fulfilled the contract agreement, shake hands. Thank you so much. And I'm not doing this kind of work anymore. So taking those actions would would teach you so much so fast. So I, I love that you shared that and you talk to us in two years from now, even, and there's a good chance we will have pivoted a little bit more with ever refining, niching and growing. That's just the whole nature of this journey, which leads me perfectly into the next question I wanted to ask you. Are you hundred percent in your business or do you have another full-time job and operating your business at the same time? Currently, I am full-time in my business. Let me answer the question first. Currently, I am full-time <laughs> in my business. However, I have not always been full-time in my business. So when I first started, I was part-time in my business, working multiple part-time jobs. I was working as an adjunct instructor. I was teaching Biostats 1 and Biostats 2. Once again, do not call me. (laughs) I got burnt out teaching (laughs) Biostats. Okay. So I taught Biostats. I worked as online health coach for a little while, but you know, you'll see stuff on, on the internet all the time. It's like, oh, pursue your entrepreneurship dream and do this and do that. And people don't talk about, yo, it's hard to make ends meet. That money don't come in. <laughs> when you first start, it's hard. So you still have to make ends meet. And so it's okay if you need to work your nine to five or work part time or do whatever you got to do because the bill still got to be paid. And I tell people all the time, my business has money. That don't mean I got money. Like, let's be clear. You have to really separate yourself from the business because you have to get to the point. I'm just now, I've been in this four years. I'm just now getting to the point this year where I'm able to pay myself consistently. And I have to work hard at paying myself consistently and be intentional about it because there are so many moving pieces. There are other people that I have to pay. There are other programs and softwares and things like that, that I have to get paid. You got taxes. We need a whole episode on tax. Because <laughs> <I know. laughs> quarterly estimated tax payments is a, is a different beast. Like I didn't know that that was a thing. So when it comes to working full-time and part-time, it has taken me time to be able to make the decision And have the things in place so that I can work full time in my business. There's a lot to consider when you're going to go that route. So I've done both, but currently I'm full time in my business and I do love it. I do love it. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Thank you for being so open about it because that's so true. There's a lot to learn, but you know, we're really lifelong learners. I mean, all of us. As long as we're alive and breathing and growing, and we, to continue to grow, we're, we have to continue to learn. That doesn't necessarily mean the next degree. And I keep saying that because there are a lot of alternatives to just jumping back in to get another degree. But just position yourself and know that it's a process and it's going to take time. And yeah, but if your goal is to ultimately be in that, you know, working for your business, working in the business 100%, you know, set that, envision that and strive to get there some people rip the bandaid off and jump right in. You know, everybody's journey to this point is d- very different and it all depends on your circumstances and everything. But yeah, I thank you for sharing that view and that perspective and that part of your journey. So I think that that's going to be very helpful as people listen. So the next two questions are kind of like the, the love hate, but not, I don't want to use hate. So I would like for you to first share with me what you like most about consulting and entrepreneurship in this journey. I will say what I like most is the freedom and flexibility and that and that's across a lot of different things. So, of course, freedom and flexibility in terms of time, like I don't have to ask nobody for PTO. I don't have to ask nobody if I can go on vacation or, you know, leave early or whatever. If I want to take a nap in the middle of the day, I can, you know, so there's freedom and flexibility in that aspect. But there's also freedom and flexibility in how I choose to use my skills. And I'm the only person that knows my skills and how they can best be leveraged. And so like I've been an employee before. I've worked full time for a nonprofit, for an FQHC. I've done that before. And so 
I know what it feels like to be able to see something and say, oh, this will be a really great idea to help do A, B, and C, and but your supervisor puts you down. Or your supervisor is like, oh, no, we can't do that. Or they steal your idea and they don't give you credit for it, right? So having that toxicity in the work environment and not being able to have that complete freedom And I I literally feel like as an entrepreneur, there's no limitation. I could come up with the most creative thing that I want to do and give it a shot and see if it works. I eat podcasting. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I didn't have to ask nobody. I just do it. Right, right. And and see how it goes. And then if it's something I want to stop doing, I don't have to ask nobody. I can just stop doing it if it's not working. So I love the freedom and the flexibility of being an entrepreneur. And I feel like I can be my best self, not only for my community and what I'm doing, but also for my family. I can be my best self for me. Don't forget that part, right? Do your best self for you. And I'm learning that. I'm learning that, you know, how to create boundaries, right? As an entrepreneur, it's easy to work 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours a day when you first start now, especially when you're wearing all the hats. But now I have to say, okay, you know what? I just started implementing this. I got a hard stop at six o'clock in the evening. I'm not working past six. That's how I can honor and be my best self. I'm not working past six. So, yeah. I love that. That's one of my favorite things about it too. So all the freedoms that you just described, same. Absolutely Love it. I mean, for like on a personal note, like when life is happening, you know, like you say, you need to take off, you need to be there. I spent a good year caring for my mother who was fighting cancer before she passed away. And just that flexibility. I sometimes I keep a backpack where I have a laptop, all the stuff, my office in a bag. So if I needed to be over there with her and take a meeting, I could go into a different room, take a meeting. If I needed to go wherever I needed to go and do whatever, it's just that flexibility that freedom, like you said, that freedom, not having to go through people and just, it's truly one of my favorite parts of this road as well. So same vein now, what's your least favorite or what you like least about this entrepreneurship consulting journey? Uh, that's hard. What do I like least? I would probably have to say, I mean, I like a challenge, but entrepreneurship, Golly, like <laughs> it's just everything is so hard to figure out and everything keeps changing, right? And so it's hard to, and I, I have had to learn and I nearly like burnt myself out doing this. Entrepreneurship is the long game. So whatever goal you set for yourself, the goals keep changing, And so you really have to be aware of what you are going after and what those challenges are and how to overcome those barriers and not burn yourself out. Like it's really easy to burn yourself out as an entrepreneur because it is so challenging. So that would probably have to be the thing that I like the least. Like it's a learning process. It's challenging. I literally saw a post the other day and I think it was on Instagram or something. And it was like, I forgot how it was worded, but it was like, you want to improve your trust in God or you want to work in your trust in God, become an entrepreneur. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because you've been sitting there looking crazy sometimes. Like, when is my check going to come? Yeah. Or, you know, when is this next project going to come? When is this next contract going to come? What do I have to do to make this thing? move in the right direction, like it is challenging. And if you're not somebody who's up for the challenge of a lifetime, don't become an entrepreneur because it will challenge everything you thought you knew about yourself. (laughs) It's funny you said that. I was literally sitting in church yesterday and a pastor sermon was something like working your faith or something like that. And I was listening to it and I was thinking, I mean, sometimes I make my best <laughs> notes for podcasting while I'm in church. I'm thinking, I need to turn this into an episode because like you can't walk this path without faith. You know, you have to really, it will definitely strengthen your faith because you're believing in something that you can't see, you know, 
sometimes it hasn't happened, hasn't fully evolved. It's not like you have a, you know, you can have a nice business plan or goals and all that, but you really have to get from one step to the next. It's always a faith walk. So yes, those challenges, I think it's also kind of going back to some things you pointed out earlier, you know, like along with the freedoms, you don't have to ask about all those other things. Like the flip side of that is you're the one creating it all. So when you go into a job, you know, you're given the instructions, you're told, you know, this is how we do it. The SOP is already written. We're writing our own SOPs. (laughs) And often it's when we hit a bump that we realize, oh, we need an SOP or a policy for this, you know? So yeah, like you said, this path is not for everyone. If you want to kind of like it created for you and go with the flow, then this is this is not the path for you. But if you really do like a challenge and you're a problem solver and you, you know, are committed to this lifelong learning journey and not getting married to a system because what you create and works for you for like a year or two, you may need to change that. It's not necessarily going to work the same way forever. You have to be willing and, and flexible. So some great things to point out. Yeah. And the the consistency. I say that was that's been one of the best things for me. And I say one of my best traits that allow me to pursue entrepreneurship is that I'm consistent and people don't often understand when we say consistent, we don't mean giving 100 percent every single day. Like it's just working towards it. Some days it might be 5 percent. Some days it might be 10 percent. Some days it might be 110 percent. But You got to be constantly working towards it and knowing that it's going to evolve and shift over time. So that consistency piece, but it builds your muscle, though. That's the thing. It builds that entrepreneurship muscle. I love everything you said. Like if someone's listening and you haven't been taking notes, you need to go back a little bit and listen again and take some notes. There's some really good gold nuggets being dropped here. So one more question here kind of going back to your business and your focus and how you're serving. I think we've kind of pulled it all together, but let's connect all those dots and kind of share connecting this all back into public health and what you're doing. But the question is, in what ways are you advancing public health with your business? So I do that in a few ways. So the first way is working with these organizations as a thought partner. Right. And I tell people all the time, sometimes, when, especially when it comes to community engaged research, when you are in the thick of it, in the middle of it and you come across challenges, it's hard to see the light sometimes. And so to be able to have someone who's external to what you're doing, who can see all the different pieces. I have somebody who says from a 35,000 foot view. Right. You know, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. It's just everything is in front of you. Right. So to be able to work with organizations, we have a process that's called strategic advisement. And so through that strategic advisement process, we work with those organizations to help figure out, okay, let's do a deep dive. What do you have going on? What does your project look like or your research look like? What are some of the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats around what you have currently going on? And then what are some recommendations that we can provide to help you navigate these challenges and be able to see some opportunities as well so that we can move this to the next step and make sure that you're on track to work with your communities in a much more efficient way. So that is one particular way that we work with organizations to advance public health because it can be a lot. Another way is through training, right? And I know sometimes we get tired of training, but professional development, continuing education is important. And so one of the things that I realized, especially as I started developing my business, is that, you know, I could provide trainings and workshops. I could talk about this stuff in my sleep. Right. But when it comes to specific organizations or communities, everybody's different. The way somebody needs health communication taught over here is different than the way somebody needs health communication taught over there. Right. And so I really enjoy being able to work with these organizations in helping craft a customized training experience for their community members, whether that's research and data literacy for their community members, or if it's training their staff, their public health staff and team members around what that looks like and being able to do it in a very engaging way. Because we don't want trainings to be boring. We've had enough of those. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) We don't want trainings to be boring. We also, we want to make sure that we have trainings that are application-based too. 
You know, it's one thing to know it in theory. It's another thing to be able to do it in practice. So that's another way that we advance public health is through making sure that we have the knowledge and the skills necessary, not just for our public health staff, but also for our communities to understand research. The third way is by offering research support. So sometimes you have organizations, maybe they don't have the capacity to do data collection and data analysis and write up the reports and do all those things. And so what we're able to do is provide some research support, whether that's planning and design, the collection, the analysis process, the dissemination process. We're able to increase that capacity around research support so that we can make sure that this research is positioned in a way that is going to actually lead to solution. So those would be the different ways that we advance public health through the business. Oh, wonderful. So I just have one question, kind of maybe asking for a friend. (laughs) Does any of that include survey development or questionnaire development? Yes. So that includes survey development, focus groups, also evaluations, assessments. Although, of course, research and evaluation are two different things. You know, and that's different from assessment. Right. But kind of talking about it all together, there are going to be some some there's data collection, there's data analysis. There are things that happen across all those different things. Right. So we handle a variety of different things as it relates to research, evaluation and assessment. Okay, perfect. This has been so much fun. And I really enjoy hearing you be able to articulate and I know you've we've talked about this throughout this conversation and this interview, that you being able to succinctly describe how you're serving and how you're helping is a result of that process you talked about, you know, working through the experience, refining, you know, and that's wonderful to be able to hear. As of course I've talked about this journey. Now you've been in our mastermind group program since the very beginning. And like I said before, I've known you for a long time before that. I would love for you to just take a moment and maybe for someone who's listening, they've been hearing me talk about the mastermind program and thinking about it. Of course, we only have enrollment two times a year. So depending on when they're hearing this episode, the enrollment opportunity is June and December. But if you could just share a little bit about your experience and how it's helped you in terms of our mastermind program. Yeah, of course. And with the mastermind, I will say that it is very helpful to have people around you, to have a community that understands. Like that is the biggest benefit. Having people who are on the journey with you, because entrepreneurship can be lonely. And a lot of times, especially when you are in the space of being a solopreneur, and you are just trying to figure out everything on your own. I mean, even if you are, you know, at a point in your entrepreneurship journey where maybe you do have a small team or you do have someone else who, who you partner with or works with you, it makes a difference when you're able to be in community with people and they are able to understand the challenges that you are going through. And to have a place to bring your questions, to have a place to bring your problems and to hear people say, oh, I went through that. Here is how I dealt with it. Right. And so you have a direct link to somebody and to people who are in different points of their journey. And so that has been key for me, as well as the visibility, being able to participate in LinkedIn lives and being able to participate in our retreats. Right. Because there's just so much knowledge and information and wisdom that we can gain from one another. And then I can be able to show others, oh, this is what I'm learning. This is the journey that I'm going through. So the mastermind has been a sense of comfort, I'll say. This entrepreneurship journey is very uneasy. You need a place to go where you can rest. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I feel like the mastermind is the place where I can go, where I can like be at ease and rest for a little bit on the journey. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that a lot of our members feel that way. For us, it's not about a lot of people. It's about the right people at the right stage and time. And everybody shows up with this heart for collaboration, for supporting. It's a space to be, you know, heard and seen. And we're watching each other grow. So, you know, you mentioned something really important. Like you're there to receive from other people, but you also have a lot to share and give and help other people at the same time. 
Well, thank you for just your time and sharing so much on this podcast and for being a part of my close community. And yeah, we're going to share links to connecting with you on the description and the show notes for this episode. However, I'm going to add this little, little bit, as she's mentioned several times, connect with Dr. Joy. I think it's wonderful to connect, to absolutely listen to her podcast and support her on social media to see what she's doing and, and the type of clients. But she's not, I'm not encouraging you to connect, to get her to teach you how to start your business or to you know help with biostatistics. Like she said, not those things. But if you, this podcast will help you with tidbits on how to start your business. If you're curious about our mastermind program, you know, we always talk about how you can apply to that and learn more. We've got a whole website page on that. But this is really the purpose of this podcast episode and having her as a guest is to share that inspiration, her story. So if if you resonate with her and you feel, you know, whatever part of her story, then I encourage you to connect with her. Maybe you work for an organization or you know people who you want to connect her with, and that could be a great client for her. That's how we support each other and keep keep going. So that's what I encourage you to connect with her, learn more about what she's doing. And like I said, absolutely listen to her podcast and continue to share that with other people that you know. And I think that would be just a great way of thanking her for coming here and sharing so much on this episode. So thank you, Dr. Joy, one more time. And I'll be seeing you soon. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. Until next time, have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you for listening. Visit publichealthentrepreneurs.com to learn more.